on TV, radio and online. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. A museum in London accuses itself of being racist, FIFA allow rainbow flags at the Qatari World Cup, and a Cambridge College dean claims that Jesus was transgender. This is Free Speech Nation. <laughs> Welcome to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So this is a show where we take a look at culture, current affairs and politics. Plus, we keep a track on the bizarre antics of those social justice activists who kindly provide us with enough content for a two-hour show every week. Coming up, I'm going to be talking to Eric Kaufman, Professor of po Politics at Birkbeck College, about a new report which suggests almost half of young people think that Britain is structurally racist. I'll also be speaking to political YouTuber Maya Tusi about the bravery of the Iran football team and supporters at the World Cup in Qatar who have been sending a powerful message to their government back home. And feminist campaigner Kelly J. Keane will tell us about how she has been threatened with arrest after being reported for hate crime at a rally in Brighton. And political and cultural commentator Ella Whelan will be here to discuss a potential conflict between disability rights and the right to an abortion. But before we get on with all of that, I'd like to welcome my lovely panellists for the evening. I have comedians Sajila Kershey and Francis Foster. <laughs> Both. Very well, mate. Francis, you've been touring. Stand I up have, I have touring. Been, I've been doing my tour up and down the country. It's been really, really enjoyable. Oh, um, yes. It's been a lot of fun. We've got two shows left that I'm doing with uh, Leo Curse. Ah, yeah. Leo Curse. He's normally here. He's normally he never here. Leaves. Yeah, he normally actually sleeps on that sofa he over does, there. He? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're doing a show in Leicester on the 20th and Stafford on the 21st. Amazing. Fantastic. Sajida, how have you been? Uh, I'm OK. I will be touring next Are year. You? Yeah, I'm going to New Zealand and Australia with a new show. Blimey, international. Yeah, yes, free speech uh, and rah-rah skirts. Very so, nice. Yeah. Is, is that the title? Uh, no, I dreamt the title. Oh, so okay. I thought I had a dream. And, I th and, and actually, it's all fitting in nicely, because then it's about the culture wars. And, yes, uh, very good. And, and saw a trans, uh, a sort of, like, topical thing coming up on Facebook and... They were wearing a, 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 a rara score. I thought, oh my God, it's my dream. OK. So there you go, yeah. So, there, so, so it's all happening. It's an omen. It's all happening, it's all happening, yeah. Wonderful. Still okay. write it. Fantastic. <laughs> and you brought me some seeds. I have. Week. Nigella a... seeds, and yes. they're called Kalonji's seeds, um, and they literally cure everything apart from death. OK. Uh, yeah. Because I had that this death week. Not death. I didn't have death. I had, uh, I had COVID, COVID this week yeah. again for the third time. Um, and you say that this will... And I'm yeah. not 100% yet, but you say this will... Uh... Oh, this is, and it's amazing. Mixed with turmeric, um, uh, cinnamon... 
and garlic if you can stand it, but I know you don't really like... I don't mind it. I don't mind. Vampire. Great. Oh, by the way, I'm not... <laughs> I'm negative, so we're all OK. We're all fine, <laughs> just in case the audience were getting a bit nervous there. Uh, but thank you for that, Sajila. We're going to get some questions from our lovely audience. We're going to start with a question from Colin. Where is Colin? Yeah, hi, hi, Colin. Here. How are you? Hi, oh, good. Um, should we have to start paying to use the NHS? OK, so there's a report in The Times this weekend mm. which pointed out that in the Republic of Ireland, patients are being charged for things such as doctor's appointments and hospital stays, up to 50 quid a time. Uh, should we be doing that? Well, I think the question we're really asking ourselves is, does the NHS actually work for the ordinary person? And the reality is, Andrew, I don't think it does. What do you mean by that? Do you mean because you have to have endless queues, because, because you can't reach anyone? Because, because of all of those things. It's impossible to get a GP appointment. You have to wait months in order to go and see a consultant. The entire system seems to be clogged up. The reality is it's not working at the moment, so that's what we're mooting, is to pay £50 in order to inject more money into the system and hopefully being able, once they get more money into the system, they'll be able to invest in more doctors, nurses, GPs, etc. Well, shouldn't that be coming from the government, though? I mean, isn't it their responsibility? Well, uh, Jeremy Hunt actually pledged even more money for the NHS. I mean, the problem is, is the NHS at the moment is a bureaucratic, bureaucratic black hole which just seems to suck more and more money into it. And look, they... And that's not to denigrate the work the nurses and the doctors do. My, my girlfriend was, was actually had to have a pretty major operation on the NHS. The staff were incredible. But it was so obvious that they were overstretched. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, though, Sajila. I kind of feel, what is the alternative? I'm a big fan of the NHS. If you go to America, mm, yeah. if you're poor and yeah. you get sick, you're yeah. in trouble. You just die, yeah. basically. We don't, we don't want that here. No. And having uh, used the NHS quite a lot in the mm. last few years, uh, I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly of it. So it's yeah. not like a simple matter of, I mean, you know, waiting times, what, if you go into A&E, is, is appalling, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. about, like, doctors get, trying to get a doctor. But when it's good, it's really good. They literally saved really? my life. However, they've also, like, given me a lot of distress. And I think that's based on individuals that work within right. the industry. And also, I would agree with you uh, uh, it, that, that bureaucracy is really... Where, where the issues are. Is that where most of the money is going? Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but, you know, you've got to admit, though, Francis, it's a much better system. I mean, I saw this documentary in America about the American healthcare system. There was a terrible si uh, situation where a man had sawn off accidentally two of his fingers, mm. and he effectively had to decide which one he wanted sewn back on because he couldn't afford both, right? Mm. And oh, like, that, to me, is just horrible. But, you know, I use all my fingers. I don't yeah. want to be faced with that kind of choice. <laughs> I mean, look, it's a very good point, and the American system is obviously awful, and we should avoid it. And I am not someone who's calling for a private or an American or an insurance style system, I just think we really need to be honest and just admit that what we have at the moment isn't fit for purpose yeah. and it needs reforming of some sort. Yeah, and you don't need to take, a... you, I'm sorry, but you don't need to take his choice with which finger or which testicle to lose. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's no, I mean you don't want to be in that sort of situation. Yeah, don't, no, don't, you, no, don't, you don't. No. You don't want to make that decision. No, that's why the doctor makes it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We're going to move on to another question now. We've got a question from Peter. Where is Peter? I'm here. Hi. Hi, Peter. Hi. Now, what action do you think should be taken against the London Fire Brigade? OK, so there's been this report this week, and it's mm. gone viral online because uh, the London Fire Brigade, it's been found to be, have a toxic culture uh, that allows bullying and abuse. It's been told that it is systemically racist, misogynistic. I mean, pretty damning uh, report overall. So is this, Sajila, is it a problem of a sort of institutional systemic thing? Or is it that there are bad apples within the service? You know, I always wonder about this kind of thing. Because if there's a system in place, that implies that there are rules in place that make it racist, make it misogynistic. Or is it just there are bad people attracted to the I, I don't know, because this seems to be coming up quite a lot. We've got it in the police force. And so uh, it well, doesn't... the misogyny Yeah, the element. misogyny, the, the, you know, the racism. We've had that kind of come up before. Uh, there's been lots of, you know, kind of things said that, that lots of institutions are institutionally racist. Uh, but with the fire brigade, I guess, because it is such a... It's such a dangerous job that they do, and, they, you know, and it should be celebrated what the work they do, same as the police. Yeah. That sometimes I wonder if, like, what is gallows humour or what is... can go too far and what then becomes, like, banter, but it's actually quite You offensive. wonder about that, don't you? Those, those yeah. sort of dangerous jobs, you can imagine that that yeah. kind of humour... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the way people deal with yeah. really, really scary situations. We don't situations. risk our lives, but our This is the hardest job in the world to do, <laughs> This is tougher than being a bomb disposal expert. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be kidding. Brain surgery. What, oh, what I do oh, no. is absolutely yeah. immense. Go on, Francis. Do you think it's just gallows humour? Do you think, actually, you know, they... they is it more that the, the, the officials, the people in charge, haven't been doing enough to crack down when there are these issues going on? I think the answer is, uh, Andrew, to cancel Fireman Sam. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, it's that's about it. Fireman Sam. It is, a, you know, like, he's just a symbol of a patriarchal, cisgendered white man, <laughs> and we need to get rid of him. You know, you say that, but there was an article a few years ago about how Fireman Sam was putting women off 
joining the police force because <laughs> they don't feel represented. But do women really mistake real life for cartoons? Oh, no, actually, I've seen, I, I know fire, we all fire women. Yeah. They are I, I'm stunning, beautiful, and kick ass and everything else. Mm. Uh, like you, but they do face these things, and they have said that they have they're faced misogyny. They're not upset about They weren't going to not join. They're, no, they're not going to join because Fire and Sam. But I do think <laughs> credit that, them a bit more, <laughs> yeah, a bit yeah. more toughness no, than that. Right? I think I think women are joined because they think they can do the job, and quite right. rightly they should be allowed yeah, to course. do the job. But I, I can see where that misogyny and that racism comes in. That kind of uh, it's, it's just like the army, any institution like that. Yeah. I think it's going to it's going to have its problems. I think it's naive of us to think that we're not that to, to, to whitewash it over literally and say, oh no, racism's not real. You know, if we, if we fixed it, we've cured it. Yay! Mm. You I know, don't think anyone's saying that. Are they? No, no, but there is there is a tendency to think, oh come on, we are yes, we are a welcoming country. However, there are still pockets of this going on. But I think we should leave Fireman Sam alone. Leave, fi <laughs> leave <laughs> Fireman Sam alone. Let's leave him out of it. Uh, we're going to move on to another question now. This is from Catherine. Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Um, should we close museums if their collections are not considered woke enough? So this was a mad thread mm. that was put out the other day. I noticed this, I retweeted this, is from the Wellcome Trust. Mm. Uh, and the Wellcome Trust have form on this, right? Because the Wellcome Trust a couple of years ago, uh, they pitched an event, they publicised an event aimed at Womxin, W-O-M-X-N, <laughs> not women, because apparently it's Wimex and I don't yeah. know, or is that you pronounce it? I don't know. So they have clearly a kind of weird ideological bias. Um, but now they've said they're going to close one of their permanent displays. And this is a display called Medicine Man. Uh, these are objects relating to sex, birth and death. All of them were collected by Sir Henry Welcome, where you get the name Welcome Collection. And that was in the late 19th century. But the museum now says that this portrays a version of medical history that is based on racist, sexist and ableist theories and language. Is it anything to do with the fact that he was, you know, around in the 1800s? Well, that might be to do with it, because yeah. if you look back at people's behaviour in the 1800s, they were pretty racist, they were pretty sexist, yeah. and uh, they were pretty ableist. Isn't there an issue, though? Isn't a museum supposed to sort of preser preserve things from the past? It sounds a bit like they're upset because they've got th old things. Yeah, you know, that, that's things. what it sounds like. Why can't you just say it's old things? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, know, you know my stance on this. I don't believe in like cancelling um, history because history is really important. Mm. You know, we can't just like erase all this. And I always think, who's who's who benefits from this ultimately when we erase all this history? But isn't because it weird? It, because it's, a, it's a museum. It's, it's a, a museum. museum that's saying what is what it's for. People in the past had different attitudes. Well, yeah. surprise, surprise! A ten-year-old child could have told you that. Yeah. Why is a curator of a museum thinking it has to shut itself down because someone in the 1800s said? said something that we don't find acceptable. It's weird. But also in the 1800s, I don't think that we had, like... What, did they understand what racism was? Was that a word? Was sexism a, a word? They had completely different... Ableism? They wouldn't know. have had that. So yeah. it's history. Just report history as it was. It's in a museum. That's where we expect to find these things. Yeah. I don't know... Is it because it's going like, to trigger someone? What is it? Why, why is it, this happening? It, it is pretty nonsensical, isn't it? They've even, like, so there was a sign-up in the Welcome mm. Collection saying that they've uh, reserved a space in a pavilion mm. for collective healing. So if, oh if people God. going to the museum are upset <laughs> or traumatised by seeing artefacts from the past, which, you know, let's face it, if you go to a museum, you're probably going to see a few of those, <laughs> you can go to this space, have some collective healing and sort your life out. What's going do, on there? Do you know what it is? It's, and I noticed it because I actually went to the British Museum uh, to an exhibition on female goddesses and divinity. Mm. And what happened was, so they had, they, they had the artefact, they had where they found the artefact, the history of the artefact, and then they had a female comedian explain why this artefact was, you, you know, why you should find it interesting from a female point of view. OK. And you, you just saw, that, number one, this is deeply patronising, and number two, it's ridiculous. What's going to be the next step? Have the Elgin marbles explained to you by David Beckham? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is an odd one, isn't it? What, what I find that's happening now, whenever I go to an exhibit or something, there's always a sign-up sort of lecturing us about why we should find it offensive. And I find that really weird, you know. Put, by all means, put something in historical context. But I don't need to be... Exp I don't need that explained I, to me. It's oh, well, I don't know. I think I need that. Sometimes Do I you? don't know that I need to be offended. <laughs> and I need uh, that reminder. You don't get offended I, enough, Sajid. Yeah. No, I know. And sometimes You've got to get I, with I, it. I, oh, my God, I feel so guilty I haven't been offended. Yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody put a sign up, so it's not my fault. You should be offended, offended by the words and actions by people, of people who've been dead for centuries. Mm -hmm. They're the people we really need to target. I know, dead people. They've been getting away them. for way too long, these dead people. I'm sick of them. But, but, it's, not also, but it's, not, it's not just that. It, it's also, as well, that we now need... We've got this weird desire to project like, our own morality onto these people and our own ways of viewing the world. Like, there was this ancient Hindu goddess in this who was a kind of a shapeshifter. And, you know, sometimes she appeared as a woman, sometimes she appeared as a spirit, sometimes she appeared as a man, and they went... They, and then th this podcast, the comedian went, 
I see this this goddess as they them. <laughs> mm, I doubt the goddess used pronouns incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, that's not only quite offensive to, for historians, but also I think for Hindus who probably don't want gender ideology being projected so onto their god. It's, it's a weird kind of arrogance when we impose our own obsessions onto every facet mm. of the past. I mean, I, I, I find it bizarre. Yeah. Very interesting, though. We're going to move on to another question now, and this one is from Catherine. This is Catherine with a C. So last time we had a, Cath <laughs> last time we had a Catherine with a K, now it's Catherine with a C. It's qualification. Yeah, you see, diversity, that's what it's all about. Um, are you pleased FIFA backed down over rainbow hats well, and did, flags? Well, they did, they? Yeah, FIFA... So, as you know, the World Cup's going on in Qatar, which is about my limit of my knowledge of what's going on out there. Um, but the sports governing body, FIFA, they, they've uh, been angering fans with their treatment of those who wanted to display the, the rainbow symbols, the LGBTQIA plus symbols, or whatever it's called now. And fans at Wales' opening match against USA, they wore rainbow bucket hats and flags. These were confiscated. Then FIFA reversed course, and now they're saying, no, you can wear the rainbow stuff. So wh where are they standing on this? Because isn't it elite? Don't they, like, kill people for being gay in Qatar? Is that well, the... yeah, you get... I think it's up to something like six years in prison. Oh, that's all right, then. Yeah, that's which yeah. is fine, you, yeah, know. Yeah. you know. Out of sight, out of mind, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I think we've been obsessing about this fact, when we've been obsessing about it, and it's obviously awful, but we don't mention the six and a half thousand migrant workers who actually died building the stadiums. Right. We don't mention the other aspects of Qatar's appalling human rights record. And more importantly, and pertinently, we don't challenge FIFA enough for actually giving them this tournament. Yeah, so why yes, are we in I Qatar? Agree. Like, I mean, isn't it weird? I mean, they, they have a terrible human rights record. I know. Why, why do it? Why even go there? I, I, I know, why go there? But I don't know if you remember the few weeks here on this show, I said we should all go do passive-aggressively, all wear rainbow uh, outfits... Oh, yes. in, in, in order to, and, ...and play, you know, Kiss a Girl and Gay Bar and all the, all <laughs> yeah. the songs there. Songs. But, yeah, but the thing is, that, that, that is a protest... But it's FIFA, FIFA not, saying no, yeah. not Qatar. Right. So Qatar probably don't even know what the rainbows are about. So they wouldn't have known. So it would, would, you know, it would have been a nice thing to do. But why are FIFA getting offended again? Someone getting offended with somebody else's Is it that FIFA are nervous that if they allow this sort of thing to go ahead, then they will get kicked out or they will cause trouble with Good. Qatar? Good, get them kicked out because right. actually that might actually highlight what's going on there. You've all been paid already. It's not mm. like it's a big deal. Why go there in the first place? But I agree with you, uh, it, it, it is a hypocrisy. Because it's not just a Qatar. It, we still do, you know, sports events in other places which don't have great human rights, uh, you know, kind of record. Yes. Um, and actually, I think Iran showed more courage by what they did by not singing their national anthem yes. than we did. And I'm, I'm ashamed of FIFA, actually. Uh, yes, I mean, th th but this is an interesting thing. It's the double standards of the thing, isn't it? It's the double standards of the thing. And it's also, as well, like, no one really cares. It's really. You know, it's really easy to stand up for, you know, equality, diversity in Islington, in North London, amongst all your woke mates, yeah. right? And, but then when they were asked to wear, you know, the, the rainbow armband, Harry Kane wanted to do it, he got threatened with a yellow card and then he backed down. Yeah. Which I think, if you'd done that to Gandhi, the same thing would have happened. Well, it, mate? <laughs> but this is it. It's protest comes with a risk. Yeah. Right? So, you know, when Gandhi was doing his sort of peaceful non-resistance, he knew he was going to get hurt. Yeah. That's the point. There's a risk that comes with it. If you're like, oh, no, I might get a yellow card, <laughs> so I better not do it. I mean, come on, man up. Well, yellow is part of the rainbow. Uh, there is that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. so I suppose maybe they were just going to add more cards and create the rainbow. But the hypocrisy, Sajida, I mean, we've talked about this on the show before, that, you know, when you get these corporations flying the rainbow flag in Pride Month all over London, London is awash with it, mm. and then they... But then you go to their Middle East equivalent website and there's no flag there. I, I wonder why. I mean, but it's that's so... Fear. That's pathetic. fear, though. That's, not, that's, really, that's really sad that you're scared of what, what you might lose as a result. Yeah, but it actually means something back, in those it does countries. Mean, uh, but it, that's what I'm saying. It means something. So do it there, right. because show some backbone. Absolutely. Well, we've got another question now. This is from Michaela. Where is Michaela? Hi, Michaela. Hello, Michaela. Is it Michaela? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> um, the question is, uh, could Jesus have been transgender? Could Jesus have been transgender? Actually, it's Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think... Uh, well, look, I don't know. What do we think? I mean, um... No, is the answer. Um, but, but this is a de the dean of where is it? Trinity College, Cambridge. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, so, so at Cambridge University, did a, a sermon at, or invited a visiting speaker to do a sermon at Evensong mm. in the chapel, and the speaker talked about how Christ had a trans body. But did you see the reason? I mean, it was that there was a there was a wound in the image of Christ, and they said that this had connotations of female genitalia. 
It's a wound. Yeah, but it's a wound in not the right place. So they haven't done biology either. No, that's, clearly. That, your vagina's not there last time I looked. Is it, a, is it an obsessive need? Again, we go back to what we were talking about with the welcome collection, of, of, of imposing current vogues, current trends, current obsessions onto things where it just doesn't it fit. Yeah, but there's sometimes when you go back into history, it makes sense. Like, do you remember when they thought that Jesus was black and it made sense because it's in the Middle East, mm. you know, there was some logic behind it. This has no logic. This just, ha this has, just happens to be what's the zeitgeist, zeitgeist now and we're going to take it back into biblical stuff and actually offending people on the way. Because, I mean, I'm Really not, upset some Christians. It, 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 yeah, and it is offended Christians and, and I think... You know, fair enough, free speech, yes, that's what we're kind of standing for. But you haven't really thought this through. And whose agenda are you going by? This is just to fit in the narrative, like, or perhaps to recruit um, trans Christians, like, you know, perhaps to get them on the cause. Um, I, I, and I, don't, I, I wonder why they've gone... Well, I mean, I wonder about this. I did read a book when I was a kid called The Sacred Virgin and the Holy Whore, which was a, a conspiracy theory book that said that Jesus was a woman. And, you know, I was young and stupid, so I, mm. I bought yeah, it. Yeah. But it's actually, it's actually, when you read it again, it's a load of nonsense. But is it just this idea of kind of a revisionist approach to history? So, Francis, to give you an example of this, so a lot of trans activists mm. will say the Stonewall riots were uh, largely organised and perpetrated by black trans women. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. It's uh, lesbians and gay men. But they say this totally revised history, even though you pick up a history book and you can see it's not true. And in a way, what they're doing is trying to reclaim and, and sort of and say, well, look, the, these figures have always been prominent in society and therefore that helps our cause today. Is that what's going on there? I just, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what's going on. It's just laughable now. It's yeah. almost come to the point where it's beyond parody. Well, it is a joke. It's like, it's like the Globe Theatre saying that Joan of Arc was non-binary or Queen Elizabeth I was non-binary because if a woman shows any kind of strength or independence or moral character, yeah. she can't really be a woman, can she? I mean, it, that, that's really what's behind a lot. It, of it, right? Exactly. And, and it's deliberately misinterpreting, you know, the speeches of, for instance, in that case, it's Elizabeth I. Whereas I think if you said to Elizabeth that she was non-binary, once she'd actually understood what non-binary meant, she would probably have you executed. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And rightly so. <laughs> OK. <laughs> have I just called for execution on TV? <laughs> oh, well. I mean, that is Too currently late. fitting with your persona yeah, at the moment, exactly. Andrew. Why not? Anyway, we're going to have to go to a break on that. Uh, I've got a meeting with Ofcom. <laughs> <laughs> After the break on Free Speech Nation, Professor Eric Kaufman, who has been carrying out some research. And this is a fascinating poll which says that almost half of young people think that Britain was founded on racism and continues to be structurally racist today. So he's going to be here to tell us a lot more. Join us in a couple of minutes. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And That's it's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Narendra. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. 
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. An important report for the policy exchange think tank has suggested that a lot of young people are being taught fashionable theories as, uncontest as con uncontested fact. So the report says that a majority of the age group, 18 to 24, believes, quote, that schools should teach students that Britain was founded on racism and remains structurally racist today. The research was carried out by Eric Kaufman, an academic at Birkbeck, University of London, for the policy exchange think tank, and he joins me now. Eric Kaufman. Welcome. Great to be here. Good. Eric, can you talk us through this study that you've done for the Policy Exchange Unit? What, what are your key findings here? Well, yeah, so there is this narrative that, you know, all this talk about uh, indoctrination in schools and critical race theory is kind of a right-wing plot, moral panic. It's not really happening. Um, you know, just actually the, the other day, um, John Burko here was saying, oh, it's greatly exaggerated. And that's kind of the narrative that we're getting from the left and even parts of the centre. So what I wanted to do was say, we'll do a representative sample of 18 to 20-year-olds and ask them about what they were taught in school. So this is a random draw of young people. And what we find is actually a majority of these young people are getting critical race theory and critical gender theory in their schools. So this is, this is a fact. You can't deny this is a random survey. We're talking about exposure of millions of people to this. This, this is something I don't understand, because when Don't Divide Us, uh, the, the group that proposed liberal values and anti-racism, they looked into this. They had freedom of uh, information requests across many, many schools and, and borough councils. And it, was, it turned out that critical race theory is deeply embedded. Why do people keep denying it? <laughs> yeah. they, well, they're just lying, aren't they? This they are just... They are li it's, it's a combination of lying or not wanting to know. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Now, what they did with DDU, a lot of those schools didn't answer the FOI. Right. And then a lot of people said, well, you know, the council was recommending these materials, but the schools aren't teaching them. Again, okay. it's just nonsense. But, but what I've done is actually talk to the pupils. Well, you've been looking at young people, exactly. 1,500, so, yeah. Do you have any specific findings? What are the attitudes that young people have, say, towards yeah. uh, structural racism or the concept of gender identity ideology, this kind of thing? Well, yeah, so we, let, let me run you through a few questions just to give you an, a sense of this, right? Yeah. So, is Britain a racist country? 61% of the 18 to 20s would say yes. Uh, now, if we ask a question like, should J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publisher, you know, they split evenly between, yes, she should be dropped, and no, she shouldn't, compared to, if you take the 50-plus population, it's 85 percent, no, she shouldn't be dropped, and only 5 percent, whereas amongst the young people, it's 50-50. Can they... I mean, I know the survey probably didn't go this far, but can any of those kids justify that position? I mean, they... You know, if you have, like, half of them saying J.K. Rowling should be dropped by her publisher, can they explain why? Because there isn't really a reason, is there? Um, well, I think they would probably just say, oh, she's transphobic or something. You know, right. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of thought going into that, other than she has offended a marginalised group. So and... the point there, though, is that that is indicative of indoctrination, isn't it? Because, yeah. because th th there is well, no logical or legitimate reason for saying she should be dropped, so it is just a mantra at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, well, if your value system is such that any sort of emotional offence caused to a marginalised group is the most important thing... Yes. And free speech then falls down, truth falls down below that, then, yeah, it makes sense, of course, if that's what you believe, that this is the most important thing in the world. Now, what I would say is they're getting that mainly from social media and celebrity culture. I mean, the schools are reinforcing and not challenging. So seven in ten of these young people said this stuff was taught to them as more or less fact. Um, now, that's yeah. a surprise, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of this stuff has been accelerated over the past 10, 12 years. And in all that time, a Conservative government has been in charge. So, Conservatives say they're fighting a war on woke. It would seem to me they're, they're pushing it. Um, well, what they're doing is they are essentially turning a blind eye while the 
what I call cultural socialist left, more or less takes the field and indoctrinates this stuff in schools. So they are simply right. saying, oh yeah, we're doing something about woke. Look, we've set out some guidelines about what, you know, you're not allowed to teach BLM, but you can teach anti-racism and you can teach that Britain is systemically racist and systemic racism is a thing as part of these consensus values. So they haven't gotten serious about the problem. Um, so no, I would say even though we've had this conservative government, a lot of them are embarrassed. They're cowardly, they don't understand, well, so they're not doing anything about it. That latter point, that they don't understand, is yeah. that what's going on here? Because, you know, if you ask the average person, you know, do you think te teachers in schools should, should stand up against racism, everyone's going to say yes. And schools have done a really good job, and, and do a really good job, of when racism occurs, tackling it, challenging it. Right. But that's not what this anti-racism teaching or, or ideology is. It's the presupposition that every human interaction has racism at its core, and that all white people are complicit in rights, white supremacy, whether they like it or not. That's a huge leap from just right. challenging racism. Right, but you see what they've done is they've expanded the definition of racism from what you and I would understand it to mean, which is what you just mentioned, to this big ideology that you can have this free-floating racism without any actual racism. I mean, so they're, they're pushing this ideology under the cover of this term anti-racism. So is that the smuggling that, that in? The yeah. politicians and the various people in charge just don't understand. They just hear the phrase anti-racism and they think, yes. great, we're opposed to racism. Well, partly that, partly they're scared because if they're against something that says anti-racism on the tin, they're scared yeah. they're going to be accused of being a racist. Um, and also they just don't care enough. I mean, they care about economic management. I mean, the Conservative Party is full of essentially business liberals they don't really care about culture most of them and so they're gonna let the woke in the schools and the institutions civil service NHS go to town but it's very uh, myopic isn't it uh, because if you think about what this might mean for the long term if Absolutely. educational institutions which are meant to be about the production of knowledge and truth if they no longer value objective truth but instead value lived experience instead uh, then that means we're going to end up with a future generation that doesn't understand the importance of truth and, of course, free speech. Yeah, I mean, I think the Conservatives have convinced themselves that somehow, oh, well, once they get a mortgage and they have families, they'll all start voting Tory. <laughs> in fact, that's just garbage, because if we look at the survey data, it's all about their cultural attitudes that's tr driving their voting. Yes. It's not about whether they have a mortgage. Are young people that have a mortgage and are paying tax, are they more likely to vote Tory? Not really. Well, they're not so, going to be able to afford a mortgage, yeah. are they? Well, even if they have a mortgage, it, it doesn't matter. This is not a material question. It's about a mind virus that they's, they've absorbed through social media and celebrity culture and at school, and they, that's sh shaped who they are. So it doesn't really matter what material circumstances they're in. And so I think the Conservatives are really deluding themselves. And I would predict once this generation comes of age, becomes the median voter, yeah, the Conservatives will be relegated to a kind of natural party of opposition, like in Canada yes. with the Conservatives. You know, they'll get into office occasionally, but they're going to be a natural party of opposition. But, you know, thanks to your report and with other work by Don't Divide Us and various groups, we do have now incontrovertible evidence Yes. Uh, that the, these ideologies are being peddled in schools. This is, is this not the equivalent of, of suddenly deciding that all UK schools need to be religious in nature and that we need to teach uh, some sort of cultish worldview as though it were fact? And isn't, isn't that a majorly serious problem? It is a huge problem, and it is just astounding how um, sort of the, the Tories are on their watch. I mean, they're just letting this happen. Yeah. Whereas if you look at other jurisdictions, you look at Ron DeSantis in Florida, or even there are periods like in, in the Ontario con uh, Conservatives in the 1980s in Canada, they said, oh, we're going to teach about Mao and the Cultural Revolution and the, and the gulags. Yes. And they changed the curriculum. I mean, you can actually do that. But this government has simply not been interested. So am I wrong yeah. to be optimistic about young people? It's just that when I give talks at various universities, yeah. Uh, a lot of the young people who come and want, they want to be challenged, they come along and talk to me afterwards. Uh, I don't get this sense of, of young people trying to shut everything down, you know? Uh, maybe, maybe that's just because I'm not interesting enough to shut down, but, you know, <laughs> it, am I getting this wrong? Um, I think you are, but you're probably getting a selection of people coming to you. I mean, for, mm. so if you look at, you know, public, you know, the opinion in the round, as I said, 60% saying Britain is a racist society. Uh, you know, we had, there was a survey, 60% think that universities should be protecting people from speech more than allowing free speech. Yeah, I think that the modal default programming that they're coming to university with already, I don't think the universities are doing that much. It's actually the schools, celebrity culture, etc. They are coming to university, you know, with this cultural socialist mind view. Saying that, you know, when Helen Joyce gave a talk at Gonville and Keyes College in yeah. Cambridge, there were academics sort of, well, let's be honest, lying about her and what she said and encouraging students to protest and uh, try and drown out her words with noises and drums and blaring horns and all the rest of it. So, 
it is to an extent coming from ideologically driven academics who are more activists rather than academics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what I would say is the activist academics are influencing the schools, are influencing the wider culture. Yes. I don't think that in class most students are becoming indoctrinated. I think they're already, so in the report we can see that even people who haven't attended university, they're taking a year before they attend university, they are as woke as the people that are at university. So I, I don't, okay. but, but, and a number of studies have shown this, they're already programmed by the time they step onto the campus. Can I ask though, I mean I'm still yeah. in contact with a lot of teachers, I used to be a teacher, and they do send me messages of training sessions they have to sit right. through, unconscious bias training sessions with all the evidence tells us achieves absolutely nothing, but they're still going ahead anyway. Right. Uh, various lectures about white privilege or gender identity ideology. And what's clear from the people who contact me is that they're afraid. They're, they're scared to say, we don't believe in any of this. Because right. if they do that, it's not necessarily they'll be fired but they won't get promoted when the next opportunity comes up, right? Is that what this is about? Um, that's partly what it's, it's partly about people being scared, but it's also partly about people seeing this kind of velvet glove around the iron fist that says anti-racism or anti-transphobia and thinking, yeah, how can you be against that? It's just yeah. so nice and I'm a caring person. I'll, I, you know, so for example, amongst academics, you know, university profs, a majority of them will support these diversity statements being mandatory before you can apply for a grant or be, be accepted into a job. Which yes. you, you have to sign up to this DEI religion before you get it. It's totally politically discriminatory. They're, or they'll support these decolonization reading lists, this agenda, right? So there are a lot of people who are going along with it because it sounds nice and they think, you know, I'm a caring person. And, yes. you know, so I, don't, I think that is the bigger thing. I think there is fear as well, but I don't think fear is the main thing. I think there's a lot of true belief. Is there also a financial incentive? It's quite a big business, isn't it? It is a big business, but again, I think all of those things kind of follow on from the fact that this religion is believed in by a lot of people, right? And, and so I think this has just become dominant in the culture. Once something becomes the dominant belief system, it drives, you know, people who are after status and money and all of these things, it starts to pay to virtue signal that belief. So uh, we're out of time, but Eric, I do want people to be able to see this report for themselves because I think it's a very important report. Where can people find it? Yeah, so if you go online and just sort of Google policy exchange culture wars, um, you should be able to find the two reports. Uh, download them, and if you don't have the time, just read, you know, the first page or two, of, of, which has the bullet, bullet point summary. And the next time that someone says critical race theory is a right-wing myth, they can lead it to they can direct uh, These to are the your... facts. I mean, if, if people think that that's not true, then do another study and show me I'm wrong. Fantastic. Eric Kaufman, thank right. you very much indeed. <laughs> and after the break on Free Speech Nation, we're going to hear, be hearing about how the Iranian football team and supporters have been using the World Cup to show their distaste for the country's regime. See you in a minute. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're gonna be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio, and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from 9, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From 8, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel.
We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Later in the show, I'm going to be turning Agony Uncle with the help of my wonderful panel, Sajila Kershey and Francis Foster, and we're going to help you to deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. So, if you have any problem whatsoever, just email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk and we will do our level best to answer all of your issues. So, it's been an emotional week for the Iranian footballers and supporters at the World Cup in Qatar. Ahead of Monday's game against England, the team stayed silent during the national anthem as they offered their support to the protests which have swept the country since the death in police custody of Masa Amini. It's feared some of the players could face reprisals for their silence when they go home. And when Iran were back in action against Wales on Monday, some players mumbled their way through the anthem while the fans booed and jeered at the regime. So here to tell me some more about the protests, I'm pleased to welcome the political YouTuber and commentator, Maya Tusi. Thank you very much for joining me today. So this is real bravery, isn't it? I mean, we talk about the various protests, taking the knee, rainbow flags, that kind of thing that footballers here do. But there's something really at stake when Iranian players refuse to sing the national anthem, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And it goes beyond that, which is quite interesting, because whilst it's absolutely brave, as you mentioned, um, obviously they they will be facing consequences or their families in Iran. So when they, during the first game they didn't sing the national anthem, absolutely brave. But for the Iranians in Iran, as a culture, they're not into virtual signaling. And for them, while they still acknowledge that that's brave, they actually said to the, to, about the players, you don't need to do that. You shouldn't have gone to be, to, to be in a position to not sing the national anthem. So for them, even that was um, too gimmicky. But, um, but of course, the second game they, they were forced but is there a unanimity on that point? I mean, I would have thought yep. that some of the protesters in Iran at the moment would be quite happy with any kind of support on the international stage. But that, that's interesting, because uh, obviously, um, from my, my position was initially also, well, maybe we should just boycott it, or the Iranian players should boycott the whole World Cup. But yes. then I realised, actually, no. Um, even though the second game, they were forced to like, mumble the national anthem, the way I see it now, while some Iranians in Iran are angry that their players are still playing while people are getting killed, in fact, the longer they stay in the World Cup, the more attention they're going to actually draw. Well, yeah, to, I mean, we're talking about it right now. Yeah, I mean, exactly. so just to give us an update on the Iranian protest. So obviously there was the death in custody of this young woman mm -hmm. by the morality police, yep. the, 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 the group that called themselves the morality police because she wasn't wearing the hijab mm -hmm. properly or the covering properly. And this has led to this huge, uh, well, revolution, really. Mm -hmm. And it's gained momentum in a way that previous attempts at these kind of things haven't, you know. Uh, you, you've got now lots of men are involved, lots of people are against the regime, they're very open, they're not afraid. I mean, you see a lot of these women talking online about how they're not afraid anymore. They've seen their friends killed and beaten, mm. but they really want to see this done. Are you, do you think this is something that might actually lead ultimately to regime change? It's not just that they're not afraid, they've actually lost the fear completely, which is quite abnormal for any human. Yes. Because we always have fear in our blood. And so th this mass army, and um, um, 22 year old who was killed, um, th this kind of was a spark for something that's already started. This, this uprising, essentially the movement started in 2017. Mm. And then it was a, what I call it, a cost of living revolution. Uh, it wasn't really political. 
and then 2019 got bigger, then COVID happened, there was a bit of a pause. Uh, so essentially, subconsciously, the nation was waiting for a any excuse, a, a spark. Yes. Uh, so when Mass Harmony died, it wasn't like plans. Oh, well, she died, let's just take advantage of um, her death. No, it wasn't that, it was just so organic. It felt like an eruption of emotion and, yeah. and you know, the, the people are... It's interesting that this has come from a, a, a feminist background because mm -hmm. women are sick of uh, having to cover their faces, their hair, which they didn't have to do before the yeah. uh, the, Iran the Iranian Revolution. This was this was this is a relatively new thing, and people say it's just a cultural difference. Well, yeah. no, Iran doesn't have this history. No, and and right now, literally all classes, all ages, and all genders, everyone's out. Yeah, uh, but it's led by a younger generation, and by younger generation, I'm talking about Generation Z, like the kids. Yes, um, but the interesting thing about them is that one. The, the, the Persian culture, but well, all Iranians, from Persians to Kurds and Turkish, um, they, they have this coincidental similarity with the Anglo-Saxon kind of mentality, which is, they, they don't really, they do symbolism, but not really virtual signals, they're not woke. So all this stuff that you see that, you know, to protect um, women, yes. it's not for some sort of third wave feminism, the kind of nonsense, they don't want to be affiliated with any of the kind of globalist movements. But the reality is that some of the chance is that, uh, while well, they're all out, but the younger kids say, um, to the, the Shah, the previous Shah, we're sorry, we're sorry, and to, to his son, the crown prince in exile, come back, come back. And it's not like that, you know, they all definitely want the king back. They're just, it's, it's more of a kind of asking for forgiveness, that we made a mistake. They actually say that our parents made a mistake, we will fix it. Well, I mean, you see uh, a lot of young women dancing, which is against yep. the law, burning yep. uh, their veils. I mean, these kind of incredibly, I mean, that's, again, real bravery. But I spoke to um, two Iranian women on this program, who were talking about how they feel that really they're being let down by feminists in the West. Mm -hmm. Feminists who often say, turn a blind eye, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, or even sometimes have argued, as has been argued in publications like The Guardian, that wearing the veil is empowering. Yeah. Well, it's very easy to say, isn't it, <laughs> if it's a choice. Not so easy to say if you're beaten with sticks for not doing so. This is why when this Iranian revolution is completed and it will happen, it's just a matter of timing, it, it, it's gone too deep to be um, crushed, no one's gonna like start shaking hands, say like, go home, everything's fine now. Yeah. Um, this could actually, whilst it's gonna be very bloody, unfortunately, but this could be quite bright for the future and actually for the West, because yes. uh, the, the Iranian, whether it's women, when it comes to fighting for individual liberty and self-determination or any other social cause, they could lead the movement, the wave against the, the Western liberals to show, for example, because right now, the reason the liberal feminists are not really saying anything is because it's awkward. It's politically incorrect. They think that they might offend some random male Muslim in the West that, oh, well, what, what, what do you do? Can, so, I, can but, I support this Iranian woman? But why would Western liberals always stand up for the most reactionary, ultra-conservative elements within Islam? Why not stand up for the, you know, gay Muslims, female yeah. Muslims? You know, why not stand up for the oppressed? They don't see it that way, because, uh, again, psychologically, the overall um, kind of uh, philosophical leftists, they just see um, underdogs. There's it's a difference between punching down and punching up. So for them, when it comes to a, again, like a, a Muslim man from the Middle East, but they don't see them the ones who are there. They, want, they, they see the ones who are here. They call them migrants or refugees, and they, they are underdogs. So they basically turn a blind eye when it comes to a, a, all the other stuff that they have. And if, they, if that person has you know, sexist views or racist views or homophobic views, they don't see it as priority because they see it as, it's not necessarily enemy of an enemy of a friend, but a similar concept because they say, well, they're white conservatives in the West. They don't like this migrant, so, uh, but they think that. Obviously, it's not true. And they say, so we're going to have to back them. So you end up with the <laughs> sanctification of, of what they perceive to be marginalised groups, exactly. even though within those marginalised groups you can have these incredibly oppressive forces. Yes, and, and, and back in the home countries, they are the conservatives, as I said. Yes, exactly. So it's like the Taliban. So I mean, if, if someone, if literally a, a, a Taliban member um, over the last decade or so had come here, which they had, they would see them as marginalised. Oh, we'll, we'll cuddle you. But now, of course, they're in Afghanistan leading. Yes. Uh, so now it's time for the, the liberals to actually criticize the Taliban. They're not doing it, they're not supporting it, but they're basically just saying, well, it's probably best to just not say anything. Well, quite selective, aren't they? So yeah. what, just bring it back to the football. Do you think that there will be potential repercussions for these players? Like you've mentioned that, you know, some people back in Iran are not necessarily happy about their tactics. Yeah. Um, but there is a, an authentic risk from the regime for behaving this way, isn't there? Or do you, do you think they will be okay? I think that they might get into trouble with the actual people. Really? Uh, the, the, because uh, people in Iran um, still, again, it's a general kind of stereotype. Their perception is that 
you're not brave enough because uh, Iranian footballers and f um, former footballers have been arrested in Iran uh, because they've been more vocal. Yes. And uh, so like a couple of their, their football legends in Iran have been like basically arrested. But then they say, well, why, why weren't you brave enough not to go to Qatar? Why are you following the orders, basically? Yeah. Um, but but, but I, th I think they're not going to be able to completely go after every single person. Like in terms of celebrities and big names, they have arrested a couple of celebrities, sometimes they um, free them. Because yes. when it's too big, you will create a new martyr. So they don't want to do that, but it's too late. They've completely lost control at this point. OK. Well, do you feel, just the final question, do you feel that, you know, we've seen some Iranian women in the stands at Qatar with their, yeah. their placards and their signs, and it feels a bit like they're putting people to shame. Harry Kane here says he won't uh, wear a rainbow flag because yeah. he doesn't want to get a yellow card. Yeah. Well, they're risking it. The women are risking a whole lot more. Yeah, absolutely. And it was funny, there were a couple of clips where the, um, the Iranian fans were actually <coughs> laughing at uh, some of the... The, the armbands and the, the symbols that the, some of the kind of Westerners, like English fans or English players, were doing. They're saying, "Well, what are you fighting about?" And it, 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 for them, these fights are trivial. But for them, they say, "Well, if you want to be in favour of any fight, any cause, support us. We just want freedom. We just want to live." And, and it's not yes. really virtual signalling, <laughs> basically. Very, very interesting. Maya Tusi, thank you very much indeed. And after the break, my panel will be back and we're going to be talking about Rishi Sunak and whether he was right to reject a Swiss-style trade deal with the EU. Don't go away. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, really? And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News.
Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So my panel, Sajida Kirshi and Francis Foster, back with me now. And I wanted to have a quick chat about politics. So last weekend, the Sunday Times reported that the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Chancellor Jeremy Hunt were inclined to seek what was dubbed a Swiss-style deal with the European Union, which would remove trade barriers and lead to a softer type of Brexit. But the Prime Minister moved quickly to rule that out, saying, under my leadership, the UK will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU rules. So it's a bit of an about face. And it does strike me, Francis, that the Tories don't really know what they want. You know, I mean, we've had obviously Liz Truss and her mini budget and Kwasi Kwarteng and the idea of economic growth being the priority. And then you have, uh, you know, Jeremy Hunt come in and completely upend that and reverse it. Then you've got Rishi saying, for some reason, we're going to entertain this Swiss style. Uh, arrangement with the EU, which was bound to annoy mm. Brexit voters, given that they voted this government in mm. on the break basis of getting Brexit done. And now he says, actually, no, we won't bother with that. Do they just not know what they stand for anymore? And before that, there was Theresa May. And before that, there was David Cameron, who yeah. was a pro-EU prime minister. And Theresa May was a pro-EU prime minister as well. You have to say that the problem with the Conservative Party, and it's not just the Conservative Party, it's also the Labour Party, is that we have a generation of politicians who have no vision. If you, if you look back to previous politicians, whether it's Thatcher, whether it's Blair, you can disagree with them. You can say, I dislike them for X, Y, Z reasons. But you knew what these people stood for. You knew what vision they had for our country. This lot, who knows? Well, I can't see any difference between them at the moment, right? No. So, I mean, the Conservatives don't seem to be particularly Conservative at all. Now you've got Labour sort of enacting what look like Tory policies now. You've got and Starmer now saying as well that he would not entertain a Swiss-style arrangement with the EU either. Well, no, well, we voted to get out of the EU, didn't we? Of course we did. So we voted to leave the EU. But the problem is, is that, like you said, these people are interchangeable, which therefore means that we don't really have any choice in our democracy. All the parties are not fit for purpose. The Conservative Party aren't Conservative. Labour don't represent the working classes. The Liberal Democrats are neither Liberal nor Democratic. So, so where do we go? I mean, this is the So, Sajila, so, look, I don't know. I couldn't vote for any of these no, showers. No, Like, uh, any of these parties. No. So, you know, aren't most people now politically homeless? Yeah. Is the problem that we need a proportional representation system which will enable smaller parties to emerge, challenge the two-party system? Because at the moment, whichever way you vote, we're getting the same sludge. Yeah, I, I think... You know what it is? I think because it's in parties, and we are politically, most of us are homeless, I mean, it's the first time I, I don't really... I'm mean, like really believe in don't waste your vote. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know, but um, I just thinking, well, where? Where do you go? I think we should, like, be investing in individuals rather than what the party line is, mm -hmm. because maybe then they might actually mm -hmm. come up with some policies, because none of them are coming up with policies. This Swiss-style... Thing. I mean, what was that? It was I mean, seriously, it's like it's like Swiss style cheese, full of holes, holes and stinks. Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah, like not it, good. It, nothing. It's not going to be nothing good can come out of it. You're just grabbing things, literally just grabbing, because you don't actually know what you want, what you stand for. And I think it's because they're all careerist, mm -hmm. and, and and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, to aim high, that's great for the next generation. But the problem with that, as we saw Suella Braverman unfold when there were, you know she was addressed by her own party about her immigration rules, is that. You don't actually understand what you're getting yourself into. You just want the title. You want the you're the glory hunters. But that's an important point, isn't it? That politics is meant to be vocational. Yeah. And it used to be the case that, for instance, among the Labour Party, you had people who had worked down the mines in the pits. Yeah. yeah. They were in Parliament, and now it's people who have done a PPE at Oxford mm. who just get in because they want the career. I mean, is that the problem that's here? Well, I had a mate who actually used to work in Downing Street, and he was actually saying that. And I was we were talking about politics, and bear in mind this was about 15 years ago, and he said. I, they're the same type of people, Francis, right or left. They go to Oxford, they tend to do PPE, they then do a master's, they then uh, have an internship with an MP, they then yep. come in and then they start working in government and then they slowly work themselves, work their way up. And what, essentially what you have is a whole generation of people who've never worked in, quote-unquote, the real world. Mm -hmm. And if you've never worked in the real world, then how can you possibly hope to represent people who are living in it? Yeah, it's difficult. And what do you think about this point about proportional representation as an option as opposed to the first-past-the-post system. Well, obviously, neither Labour nor Tories would uh, mm. favour that system, so it will never get through. But if it did, you know, all of a sudden, parties like the SDP mm. might actually have some sort of input. Well, look, Nigel Farage is a regular on this channel, and there's a lot of people who criticise Nigel and say he's far-right and all the rest of it. But to me, at the time, UKIP, under his, under, under his leadership, provided a really valuable service, which is... They were socially conservative, on the right, and they held the Tories' feet to the fire and ensured that the Conservative Party actually had Conservative policy. OK, we're going to be back in a couple of moments. See you in a second.
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 pm on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. That's and it's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Mirinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Back to Free Speech Nation. You don't have to be a qualified historian to know that tyrannies usually begin with the implementation of censorship, whether that's against freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, or freedom of speech. Tyrants are threatened by free speech because it is the means by which their corruption is exposed. Sometimes they'll impose censorship on the grounds that it's in the interest of the public. Maybe there's a terrorist threat, or a war, or subversive ideological elements that are stirring up trouble. Under such circumstances, governments give themselves what they call emergency powers or they restrict certain freedoms on the grounds that such measures are only temporary. Sometimes these temporary measures last an awfully long time. And this week, one of those terrible events occurred that can so often lead to calls for censorship. In Colorado, there was a horrific massacre at a gay bar. Five people were killed and many more were injured. A writer for the New York Times claimed that this massacre happened because conservatives had been voicing their opposition to drag shows for children. According to the author, the likes of Matt Walsh and Ron DeSantis have fostered, quote, escalating anti-gay and anti-trans violence. Many others joined in with the predictable chorus. The writer Chris Rufo was blamed for the attacks because he had exposed evidence to the public of the indoctrination of queer theory in American schools. The Twitter account Libs of TikTok was blamed for the attack simply for reposting footage of hypersexualized drag shows with children in attendance, as though simply letting people know that this was going on was somehow worse than the events themselves. Over at NBC, one commentator said, 
there is a pipeline. It starts from some smaller accounts online, like libs of TikTok, it moves to the right-wing blogosphere, and then it ends up on Tucker Carlson, or it ends up in a right-wing politician's mouth. It's a dangerous cycle, and it does have real-world consequences. We've been here before, haven't we? Whenever there's a senseless tragedy of this kind, people understandably try to find a reason why, and they often end up pointing the finger of blame in the wrong direction. So when a man started shooting cinema-goers in Colorado in 2012, during a screening of The Dark Knight Rises, many people blamed the films that he had been watching. When a psychopath in Norway shot dead 70 people on an island in 2011, commentators in the media were quick to blame some of the public figures that the killer had named in his so-called manifesto. In March 2019, 51 Muslim worshippers were murdered by a terrorist in New Zealand and all kinds of blame games began. One Australian senator said it was due to Muslim immigration. A US commentator blamed Fox News. A protester in New York harangued Chelsea Clinton and said that the attack had been stoked by people like her. It's almost as though we wanted to blame anyone but the culprit. And then came the inevitable acts of censorship. A chain of bookstores in New Zealand stopped selling Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, on the supposition that it had inspired the killer, which is a conclusion you could only reach if you hadn't read it. The New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern enacted heavy-handed internet censorship, which even extended to online discussions about the shooting. And look at what happened in this country after the horrific murder of the MP David Amos. MPs called for a new law to crack down on internet trolls. David's law, they called it. Even though the killing had nothing to do with online trolls, it was committed by a fundamentalist Islamic extremist. In other words, a tragedy was being used to justify a policy of censorship that had got nothing to do with the murder itself. And the same has happened with this appalling incident at a gay bar in Colorado. In the coverage of the shooting, the Pink News had made the following claim. The trans community has faced an onslaught of anti-LGBTQ plus bills in America just this year, with some states banning gender-affirming care for minors. And the article goes on to quote Sarah Kate Ellis, president and CEO of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, who says, you can draw a straight line from the false and vile rhetoric about LGBTQ people spread by extremists and amplified across social media, to the nearly 300 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced this year, to the dozens of attacks on our community like this one. So if you believe, as most people do, that gender-affirming care is a terrible idea, or that gender identity ideology is damaging for the rights of women and gay people, you are somehow responsible for this kind of senseless violence. As Tom Slater put it in an article for Spike this week, shut up or people will die is the take-home message here. And we've already seen activists blaming Elon Musk for allowing previously banned right-wing accounts to return to Twitter. Apparently, censorship is the only way to stop any future atrocities of the kind we saw in Colorado. And everyone seems to be blaming their political opponents. How convenient. Well, perhaps everyone should have waited a little bit before assuming they knew the motives of the attack. It turns out that the murderer identifies as non-binary with they, them pronouns. So the theory that this is a straightforwardly transphobic attack may not stack up after all. And some activists have even said, well, they don't believe him. He's just pretending to identify as non-binary to further demonize the LGBT community. And these are the same people who five minutes ago were claiming that there was never any risk of criminals exploiting gender self-identification for their own ends. Oh well, so much for that theory. The truth is we just don't know why this man committed these evil deeds. It's always better to wait until we can be certain of the facts, but so many people jumped at the chance to exploit the killings as a cudgel to beat their opponents. And this is grim stuff. And of course people are free to blame whoever they want, but it's our responsibility to criticise those who do so, to point out that they are not just analytically wrong, but morally wrong. The person to blame for the horrific murders in Colorado was the man with the gun, not those who have concerns about the ideological indoctrination of children or the frequency of hypersexualized drag shows for kids or those who have reservations about gay marriage. These are debates that we need to be able to have without people dismissing them as incitement to murder. There's even a term for it now. You may have heard it, stochastic terrorism. This is the idea that views that are offensive to certain groups necessarily lead to real-world violence. So, if you argue 
that it's wrong for small children to be taught that there are over 100 genders, and then someone commits a crime against a trans person, that's your fault. You're a stochastic terrorist. And this is a very sinister development. We've had activists claim that words are violence for a long time now, but they've moved on. Words are now terrorism. And it's a small step from here to demanding that such words are silenced completely. And this is why I mention the tactic of tyrants, who claim that there is an existential threat to society that requires emergency powers to enact censorship. If certain opinions are terroristic, surely they shouldn't be aired. But this is a ruse, a way to narrow the Overton window to prevent discussion and debate about important issues. It's an authoritarian trick, and it's simply wrong. We've had six decades of research into media effects theories, and it's provided no secure evidence of a general correlation between public behaviour and mass media consumption. And the direct effects model has been comprehensively discredited. So the evidence is in. People simply don't act on cue by the words they hear in the media. And discussion of sensitive topics is not incitement to violence. For all the claims that Conservatives are responsible for mass murder, no mainstream politician of any political stripe was anything other than horrified by the attack in Colorado. And it is unfair to pretend otherwise. And the thing is, I do understand why people reach so desperately for these false conclusions. We all find these incidents unfathomable. Emotions are running really high. And so, of course, people will resort to simplistic explanations for these inexplicable things. We can't possibly understand the mindset of this kind of evil. So if we can just point to a controversial commentator and say it's his or her fault, we can somehow resolve it. Suddenly it all makes sense. But of course, life is messy, far more complicated than that. When the murderer of John Lennon claimed that he had been inspired by J.D. Salinger's novel The Catcher in the Rye, should we have taken him seriously? Was Salinger really responsible for Lennon's death? Should every copy have been banned? Of course not. So in all these difficult discussions, we need to be wary of those who think that censorship is the answer, or who think their political opponents ought to be silenced. Stochastic terrorism isn't a thing. It's like that phrase, dog whistle, when your opponent hasn't said the thing you wanted them to say, so you, ac you accuse them of implying it or secretly thinking it. These are just tricks to shut down debate, to foster a climate in which censorship becomes the norm. And that way, tyranny lies. more questions from our audience, but I just want to come to my panel first. I was talking there about this idea of stochastic terrorism, mm. the idea that people who have legitimate concerns about the spread of gender identity ideology or hypersexualized drag mm. shows, they are to blame for violence. What do you make of it? Uh, look, it's just completely ridiculous. It reminds me a lot, actually, of... Do you remember the tragic case of Jamie Bolger? I yeah. think it was in the early 90s, where people blamed, in inverted commas, video nasties. And they said that these were the reasons why the children involved committed these horrific and awful acts, murdering Jamie Bolger. And it wasn't to do with that at all. It was to do with the fact that these children came from horrible homes where they were mistreated, where they saw acts yeah. of violence every day. So, like you said in, in, in your piece to camera, it's people looking for simple solutions to actually very complex problems. And that's a really good example. The example of James Bolger, I mean, the, the media blame the film mm. Child's Play 3. They say he watched... They, the killers watched this film. Mm. Turns out they hadn't even watched it. No. Because life is so much more complicated than those simple ideas. But it was also too complicated for the authority to look at the children that, that the, these two potentially evil children yeah. had something to do with their homes that caused them to be right. in that position. And I think, actually, we do look at, you know, for simple solutions, even, like, when it's uh, Islamic terrorists, you know, it's, like, it's easy to tar a whole community yep. and say, well, obviously, it's the religion that they practise, mostly, mostly practise, you know, peacefully, that must cause this. Right. Or it's, you know, the, the attacks in Colorado, it has to be... Well, I had that... I mentioned that with the, with the, uh, the attacks on the Muslim worshippers in Christchurch in New Zealand, because you had that Australian senator say, yeah, there's too many Muslims in the country. Then you had other people say... I was oh, there at the time. Right. I was there uh, at the time when that, that attack happened in Christchurch. 
And it was it was awful because everybody felt guilty. And, and I, I, it was great because it got I filled up my shows because out of you know pity they came. <laughs> silver know, linings, but, I yeah, suppose. Silver linings, you know. <laughs> uh, but they, they 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 just felt like this isn't us. This isn't what we do. This of isn't course. what we believe in. But it was blamed on that. Oh, they, they, because there's massive well, immigration. So, this is why some people blamed it on on immigration. But some people start blaming Jordan Peterson and saying that these books need to be banned, and they were banned momentarily. That's a, that's a danger, isn't it? I think it's a danger, banning books, burning books, anything, like, if you're trying to remove something, then you're not giving people the chance to read for themselves and decide. You know, it's a similar thing with satanic verses, which is, you know, something course, I've, course. I've, you know, studied very, very well. It's, 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 it's just that you've just heard about this, give them a chance to read it and then point it out. Even with J.K. Rowling recently, oh, she's transphobic, but where, you know, someone's or, done a whole study of it. Yeah, and, or she's and not inciting found... transphobic yeah, yeah. hatred. Well, yeah. A, she isn't. Yeah. Uh, but even if she were saying transphobic things, that wouldn't lead to people committing... No, 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 no. This is the other thing, is that the... the what I don't understand about this is I mentioned media effects theories because we've studied it for decades. Mm. It isn't true yeah. that the public are behaving in a certain way by the words they hear on TV. We just know it's not true. Why does everyone buy that? Because... It, you saw it during the pandemic where, you know, everyone wore a mask in order to protect other people, you know, from, con from contracting COVID, when we were told time and time again that those masks, the cloth masks that everyone wore, had no effect whatsoever. They did not stop the spread of the virus, yet we all wore it because we love to believe a narrative. We know that life is complicated. Well, that's, a, that's a problem, isn't it, when narratives become more important than data and facts, <laughs> and, I mean, and we're getting that all the time in everything now. But, but that's it, because life's difficult, life's hard, and you, for the average person, it's, it's a scary world that they live in. Life changes continually, and sometimes it's just easier to hold on to a narrative because it makes you feel better. OK, well, we're going to get some more questions now uh, from our audience, but this time we're going to go to our audience at home because, thank you, you've been sending your emails in. I really appreciate it. We've got a question now from Terry, and Terry says, are you planning to boycott the fashion brand Balenciaga. Am I pronouncing that right? I hope so. It's a, a well-known fashion house. Andrew, uh, you're a gay man. That should just roll <laughs> off your tongue. Roll off the tongue, I know. <laughs> I have no idea who they are. But I do know that they've had this ad campaign yeah. where they've had... Have you seen this, Sajid? Yeah. Teddy bears with bondage gear. So a, children, ch a child holding a teddy bear with bondage gear. There was another photo shoot with, a, with documentation that if you zoomed in, it was pro-paedophilia... Document now that's not accidental, right? Yeah. Now, but apparently the, the fashion house is blaming the photographer and saying they're going to sue the photographer. The photographer is saying they wouldn't have been able to do this without sanction from the fashion house. Big mess. But why the hell would you think that teddy bears I, and mm, bondage gear make a, a good bedfellow? I, I, and I was trying to work out why. I was thinking, where does this come from? So it's usually like, like some sort of inspiration. Now, Balenciaga, he was, or he or she, was it he? he I, think it's I can't even say the name, I've no idea. Yeah. Uh, they, they yes. were, <laughs> were basically called uh, the master of everyone. Right. So I was thinking, OK, maybe they've got taken it from there, like master slave and, you know, then you've got the, the bondage, the sub, the dom. But then why the child? I mean... But that, that's where it gets really sinister. And I just think there's no... I, I'm, I'm for all, you know, obviously it's, it's free speech and everything else, but... Yeah. That's what, what you're deliberately trying to be provocative, and you cannot. This cannot be a mistake. This isn't like somebody okay. signed this off and then didn't understand what what they were looking but at. But free speech is one thing, but you know the sexualisation of yeah, children that's, is quite that's... another. You know, and that because you're dealing with people who can't consent. Mm. So that's Maybe a very different happy. situation. I mean, Francis, what is going on? You know, we've seen this with... Look, a lot of these drag queen story hours are not sexualised, right? Yeah. But then some of these videos that go viral are very clearly hyper-sexualised around young children. What is it about a certain contingent of activism that think that uh, imposing very adult sexual ideas onto children is somehow progressive. Where, where's that come from? I, I have no idea where that comes from. It's deeply worrying because the whole point of... of, of well, not the whole point, but children shouldn't be sexualised. And I don't understand why that suddenly we have to talk about that because... We it was a given, wasn't it? Yeah, it, was, it was an absolute given. I mean, what are we going to look forward to in the future? Like, mother care having a gim gimp and dildo range, you know? <laughs> is, is, well, that, I mean, is that where we're, 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 we're going to be? We're not that far away if, if Balenciaga get their way. <laughs> yeah. Because the teddy bears did have... I mean, it was explicit bondage. Yeah, stuff. I know, and I, I, I agree with you. Where are we going to go? I mean, is, are, are fairy tales going to change? Children's stories, you know, is it going to be Goldie, more Goldie unlocks the three yeah. kinky bears? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what. Oh, don't where give we're them go. ideas, <laughs> Gina, please. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on now to a question from Dulcie. Dulcie says, Are you going to buy one of Twitter's Stay Woke t shirts? 
<laughs> so now, by the way, I remember back in 2015, Jack Dorsey, who was then CEO of Twitter, uh, and he was the founder of Twitter, of course, and he was standing on a stage at a conference. It was called the Recode Conference. And he was wearing this T-shirt, which said, hashtag stay woke. What I didn't know at the time is that he had bought, Jack Dorsey had clearly bought a whole pile of them. <laughs> I think we've got uh, footage, have we? Uh, Elon Musk tweeted this out. Can we have a look at this? So Elon no, Musk... Uh, <laughs> at the, at the most thing, and there's an entire... Entire closet full of secret closet of hashtag woke t shirts. So, quite unbelievable. So, so Elon Musk found those in a cupboard at Twitter. Yeah. Jack Dorsey had bought millions of them. I mean, that, that, I mean, it's you can see what their priorities were, right? Of course, you can see what their priorities were. Like uh, my YouTube channel had a had a Twitter account which was doing very, very well, trigonometry, and then it slowed down, and we were like, "Why is this?" And then my Twitter account slowed down at the same time. And it's only when we went on one of these sites where you could actually check, they yeah. found out that we were shadow banned. But we were also shadow banned on Facebook, no, on uh, Instagram. And then the more you look into it, the more you realise, oh, it's just a clear and ba blatant bias by the people running so these platforms and their employees. If people don't know at home what shadow banned is, so this is when uh, what will happen is Twitter will decide that your account is not acceptable for whatever reason. And then you can tweet away, but other people can't see it. Yeah. So you may as well not be tweeting. And this has happened to lots of people I know. They've been shadow banned. And then someone at Twitter did admit that shadow banning was a thing, because they denied it for yeah. a long time. So effectively, and, and Elon Musk has said, really, see, I think Elon Musk has done a great thing, because he's now said he's going to reveal all of the information and secret documents about the extent of platform manipulation at Twitter over the past five years. He's got access to it all. Of course, it's going to be very interesting. That to see is what going they to be did. interesting, and, I, and I'm interested by the shadow banning because I just thought I just wasn't very popular on Twitter. And now <laughs> no. I realise that no. obviously I've been shadow banned, and no yeah. one's really listening to my because they're just hiding. That's it. exactly what it yeah. must yeah, be. That's yeah. what it must it be. It must be that. I mean, this is very strange, isn't it? This idea that a small group of you know twenty something uh, eggheads in Silicon Valley got to decide for the whole world which was the right opinions, which were the correct opinions. Mm. They were banning feminists left, right and centre. Someone called Sam Barber just put up a list of all the feminists that have been banned for yeah. saying things like there are differences between men and women. Yeah. They got banned for that, right? And Musk is now saying, well, we're going to redress this. This is going to stop. We're going to bring these accounts back. Yeah. We're going to be able to have the conversations we haven't been able to have before. I think this could potentially have a huge impact on mm. the world discourse. Well, I hope so as well. But what has been also been very interesting is a reaction from celebrities and people who espouse that worldview. Oh, they're going nuts. And they're going absolutely nuts. they don't nuts. get to censor anymore. They yeah. don't like it. Yeah, and it's not that they disagree with them. It's the fact that they're able to speak that is utterly enraging yeah. them. Like Whoopi Goldberg, God bless her, and, you know, you know, one of the most foremost opinions and sages in the world has actually come off Twitter because she said, like, I can't handle it. Isn't that incredible? And I love Whoopi Goldberg as an actor. <laughs> I think she's absolutely brilliant. But that's a really silly thing to do because the idea that... Doesn't she... I don't get she, it. She's part of a show where you... Yeah, the, view. Like, yeah. the view. So surely you should be welcome. You want to hear other views, yeah, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. I don't... This is what I don't understand when people are saying, I don't get it. I'm like, if I, if I miss the memo, why is everyone leaving Twitter? What is it going to achieve? I don't understand what, what's going to happen by you leaving Twitter. Surely the, the very scary voices that you're hoping don't come on by you leaving, you just give them you make that them space. More prominent, yeah, right? yeah. And and I do think that it's scary that they've, like you said, just a handful of people have decided what our opinion should be, yes. what we should think. And I think that's where we are now. We're so divisive, mm. and someone, someone has got to be accountable for what's been happening in the last few years. And social media has been a big part of that, especially Twitter. It's going to be really interesting as well because Elon Musk is also now saying he's going to reveal what happened with the Hunter Biden laptop story. Because if you remember, what happened was uh, the New York Post. Uh, wrote an article about uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, which has some very dodgy materials on it, mm -hmm. uh, connecting him to all sorts of stuff. And the Twitter decided it was misinformation and prevented users from even sharing the article. Locked down the New York Post account, and this was in the run-up to the election, mm. which comes very close to election interference. He's going to reve reveal and li uh, release this really the exciting. information about what the conversations that went on. You know, they were effectively censoring. Uh, press, right? He's turned Twitter into an episode of EastEnders. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it's we're, brilliant. Just, we're just <laughs> waiting to get in to see what the next revelation is. Can't take my eye off it, and I love it whenever he tweets. I've got, I've got a, you know, notifications on. I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, because people go crazy, they're so upset. Anyway, after the break on Free Speech Nation. I'm, uh, a woman with Down syndrome has lost a court of appeal challenge over late-stage abortions of fetuses with certain health conditions. Journalist and author Ella Whelan will be here to discuss the significance of the case. See you in a moment.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's That's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Narinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. A woman with Down syndrome has lost a court of appeal challenge over late state abortions for fetuses with certain medical conditions. Heidi Crowder brought the case alongside Maura Lee Wilson, whose son also has Down syndrome, arguing the law stigmatizes disabled people and is discriminatory. The current law allows for pregnancy terminations up to birth for fetuses with Down syndrome and other medical conditions. The judges said the act did not interfere with the rights of the living disabled. And the case prompts an important question. Should the rights of one group affect a woman's rights to an abortion? I am joined in the studio by journalist and author Ella Whelan. <laughs> so, Ella, this is obviously a very sensitive area. Would you like to talk us through what has happened with this case and how it came about? Yes, yeah, so um, Heidi Crowter and um, the group that she works with, as well as um, Maura Lee Wilson, previously brought a case to try and uh, essentially what they want to do is highlight the fact that, as they see it, um, the current abortion law is discriminatory because uh, women can access abortion for up to 24 weeks um, under certain circumstances. People always forget that it's under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. You essentially have to prove that um, your life is at risk or that you're going to go mad to have an abortion and you have to convince two doctors. But anyway, you can do that for up to 24 weeks. But if um, your pregnancy involves a diagnosis of Down syndrome, uh, then you can you there is the possibility for you to make that decision to have an abortion later uh, later on and you know lots of women who don't get the proper testing done can find out later on uh, that that's the case with their pregnancy or indeed change their mind um, and as Crowter and the people bringing the case with her see it this is uh, not just 
something that upsets them, but it's something that is detrimental to their human rights. We, we're talking yeah. about the language of human rights here. Um, as I see it, as someone who thinks that women's freedom um, is a kind of an indivisible freedom, this is quite frankly, one of the most pernicious attacks on women's reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. It's using and weaponizing um, the language of rights to try and suppress women's uh, bodily autonomy. Because if uh, Crowther was successful in her case, thankfully she hasn't been, what would happen is that women would be restricted from making that decision to have an abortion in cases of uh, diagnosis of Down syndrome. That is, um, uh, you know, interfering in a woman's life in a way that I think is the kind of a sympathy for that kind of view is but Crow really lacking. I suppose Crowther's point, though, is that, you know, uh, the unborn uh, child or fetus, if it has Down syndrome, is treated differently from the unborn child that doesn't. And that implies a kind of uh, a, a, a lower class status for a Down syndrome individual than someone who, who doesn't have that condition. Well, there's two things to say on that. Number one, uh, you know, if you do get a diagnosis like that, I don't think anyone can know how they're going to react and how, how they're going to feel until they're in that situation. And I, I personally would never be able to judge a woman who was in that situation on whatever decision she would make. You know, having a child with Down syndrome is a joy. It can also be a great challenge. Uh, and I think that that has to be taken into account. But the second more important point is, if it is the case that these campaigners believe there is a discrepancy, well, I have the answer for them. It's to decriminalise abortion completely, to mean that there are no restrictions um, and no discrepancies between what is and isn't allowed um, for a woman to make a decision, and to just say that actually all decisions are worthy in a woman's, uh, woman's kind of aspect of looking at the future of her life, whether that be maybe it's because she, her and her partner have broken up, Maybe it's because there's been a diagnosis. Maybe it's because something has drastically changed in her life that means that she can't continue this pregnancy. Once we get in, I think, you know, there's a, there is a sort of... I don't agree with Krauss's campaign, but there is a point to be made that once we get into m saying that there are good and bad reasons for having an abortion, uh, you're interfering in the very private moment of a woman's life in a way that I don't think the law should. Isn't part of her case the concern about late-stage uh, abortions, that actually you're, you're talking about abort aborting a, uh, a, a... by this point, a sort of fully formed individual? Does that worry you at all, when it becomes so late-stage that there's very little distinction between the baby in the womb and out of the womb? Well, I think we have to be really careful about the language we use, because, you know, talking about the idea of a fully formed individual, I mean, we do make a distinction between a pregnancy which is, uh, you know, a fetus attached, which, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're having a wanted pregnancy, is a baby from the get-go. I've just had a baby and, you know, when I was four weeks pregnant, I was thinking about what it would be like as a fully formed individual. But until somebody is a member of society, you know, as the court used the term, a living human, then we make a distinction between that and a pregnancy, which is... is so your distinction is birth? Part, is, yeah, which is a pregnancy is still intrinsically part of a woman's body, and therefore the woman's rights and beliefs and desires and freedoms come first. But just on the, on the issue of late-term abortions, there's a callousness to all of this, which um, has, uh, you know, Heidi Crowder talked about the fact that the court doesn't take into account her feelings and has upset her. And that's, I'm sure that's absolutely true. And I've, I really feel for her. I wish somebody would convince her that actually women who are making the decision to have an abortion on the basis of a Down syndrome diagnosis don't devalue her at all and want her to and would love and support her to have the best life possible. And I wish someone would explain that to her because it's very it's heartbreaking seeing her go through um, so much pain and suffering on the basis of this when she doesn't have to. But on late term abortions, it, one, they're so rare. And two, what a woman has to go through to have a late term ab abortion is I can't explain how awful it must be. I mean, I think you only really realise it when you've been heavily pregnant yourself, what that entails. I won't go into what it entails medically, but you can imagine. Making that decision, women don't do it lightly. And um, what, try, I just would like people to try and get into the frame of mind of someone who is having to make that decision. They're not doing it because it's a Tuesday and they fancy it, although I think that they, they you know, in law that they should be allowed to. Women aren't that callous, they're not that... Um, they're not that sort of flippant. I think that we devalue the importance of kind of, of women's agency and the decisions that they make and why they make them, particularly at that, the very few women who make them at that late stage. But again, I mean, from what you describe, it's very clear that a lot of emotions are invested on all sides of, of this debate. And actually, when it comes to these sensitive topics, isn't it quite 
a, a, a good step forward to try and bring the emotions out of it and talk about... To, to be able to have these discussions, particularly when it comes to clashes of rights, or at least perceived clashes of rights. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's... One of the, thing, the things about abortion is that it's obviously a very personal thing because we're talking about women's personal private decisions. That's why I think it shouldn't be anything to do with any kind of legal framework. It should just be regulated on the basis of normal medical procedures, you know, safe and all the rest of it in the same way that heart surgery is, is regulated or whatever. Um, but because there is this, because it is still a moral political conundrum, because we are still, I mean, abortion is technically illegal in this country, everybody forgets that. We just have this workaround, which is the 1967 Act that says that, you know, on this basis, a doctor can be protected from being prosecuted. We don't have, women's bodily autonomy is not a legal right uh, in this country. Um, but the, to take all the emotions out of it, you have to understand that those emotions are the sole um, property of the woman. And then actually, and this is the point I made on Twitter that has upset lots of people in Heidi Crowther's campaign, other people's emotions and feelings are irrelevant. The judges ruled that though they understood why Crowther and others who were part of her campaign felt upset, that this was actually a, it was it wasn't relevant to a woman's decision to have an abortion because why would you lay the um, the, ch the kind of the magnitude of the question of disability rights on at the feet of an individual woman going into a clinic to have a procedure that's not only inhumane it's also not legally sound um, so I think that you know we have to be clear that though this is framed in terms of disability rights it's also got there's an element of kind of identity politics here and competing rights. What this really is, is an attack on women's bodily autonomy. And lots of these campaigners, as it happens, even though they uh, talk about being really against late-term abortions, also campaign against tests that women can have earlier. I mean, medical sciences and innovation has meant that tests are now readily available much earlier in a woman's pregnancy to be able to get these kind of diagnoses. So if you're upset about late-term abortions, why not allow those kind of tests early on? But, of course, um, they're, they're not in favour of that. So where, however way you look, women are hamstrung. And I think that actually this ruling, though it might seem cruel to some people, is very important for women's freedom. And I think we need to actually push it further and say that these kind of anti-choice attacks on bod women's bodily autonomy and abortion can't be allowed to take the shape of uh, sort of identity politics, the language of rights, because uh, in its kind of naked form, it's an attempt to try and suppress women's freedom. And we should push back on that. Ella Whelan, thanks very much for joining me today. And after the break on Free Speech Nation, Kelly J. Keane will be here to tell us about how she is uh, potentially being threatened with arrest after being reported for a hate crime. See you in three minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel.
We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Kelly J. Keane has been threatened with arrest and reported for a hate crime after attending a women's rights rally in Brighton. The founder of Standing for Women spoke at the gender-critical event in Brighton in September. We're going to speak to Kelly J. in a moment, but first, let's hear what Sussex Police told her. Um, so, someone has actually made an allegation um, against you mm -hmm. um, about a hate crime. Um, we need to... Um get you to come down to Brighton, ideally, so we can um, have this voluntary interview. And when you say hate crime, specifically what hate crime would it be? Because uh, I think to be a hate crime, there has to actually be a crime. So what is the hate, exactly. what, what is the hate uh, attached to? So, um, the crime is um, use of words or behaviour um, to stir up hatred on the grounds of sexual orientation. And Kelly J. Keane, also founder of the Let Women Speak Tour, Joins me now. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Kelly J, can I ask you, I did my due diligence, I watched your speech in Brighton on YouTube, I couldn't see any instances of you inciting hate against people on the grounds of sexual orientation. Am I wrong about that? Have I missed something? No, you haven't missed anything. It's, um, this is my fifth interaction with the police in the last few years since I started talking about the assault on women's rights. So, no, you haven't missed a thing. Um, I frequently champion uh, LGB and uh, talk about the assault that's also upon their rights um, presented by transgender ideology. So, if anything, I'm, um, I'm definitely lots of love towards uh, sexual orientation. So, why is it the case? And do we know who it was that, that reported you? Is this just one of the activists who was nearby being opportunistic and, and using these kind of hate speech laws in order to quash their opponents? I think it is. I think it's I think it's very entitled men using the police force as some sort of personal security force in order to shut women up. Um, and it's just not going to work. Is, are there any updates on this? Because the police contacted you and said, well, you've got to come for an interview. But they said it was voluntary, didn't they? But then if you didn't, they would arrest you. Am I reading that right? Is that what happened? No. I mean, this is what they said when uh, four years ago when Susie Green support uh, um, reported me to the police. And so uh, they said then, oh, it's voluntary, but by the way, if you don't come in, you'll be put on a wanted list and we'll find an excuse to arrest you. But I'm, I'm not going. I'm absolutely 100% not voluntarily going to any uh, police station to be interviewed and try to be entrapped into committing some sort of spurious hate crime. Um, it must get very wearing, though, to continually have the police come, come in and say you, you, you're not entitled to your free speech. It feels a little bit like the police don't necessarily know the law themselves. Well, I agree. I think on the backdrop of the fact that we all know there have been women that have been stalked um, and they report their stalker repeatedly to the police and the police ignore them and then those women end up dead, I think the fact that as soon as a man who believes he's a woman and gets very cross about women that say they're not, um, reports women's speech to the police and the police jump. I think it's, um, 
I just think it illustrates where the police are in now, 2022. You... It's disgusting. Now, you, could you talk to us a little bit about your Let Women Speak tour? Because I understand that you went to America as well, which some people would say uh, it could be quite dangerous uh, because some of, the, some of the activists out there can be very extreme. Um, but what is it that you're trying to achieve with the tour? What's the purpose behind it? It really is to create a space in which women can speak. Um, women often feel completely stifled and intimidated into silence. Right across America, you can lose your job. We had women speaking who'd um, been working somewhere for 17 years, spoke up against the transition of children and lose their jobs. We've got um, parents of children who have been convinced by schools or online communities that they're trans, um, who are having their breasts removed at sort of 13, 14 years old, these girls, um, boys being castrated before they're even 21. Um, you know, it's... It's absolutely terrifying and quite preposterous what's happening. Um, so we just wanted to open um, a, an accessible space for women to come and speak. And, and what we did is we, I, I made a documentary while I was out there. Um, that should be out before Christmas. And what it did is it, is it really revealed the violence and misogyny um, that the trans activists are absolutely drowning in. Um, but, you know, women are a constituency of our own. We are a worldwide global community um, with unique needs and uh, we will speak about our rights. Why is it that so much, when it comes to this debate and when you hear these activists sort of gathering around feminist speakers, why does so much of the language, the rhetoric, why do they resort to violent imagery, death threats, rape threats? Why is that so prevalent? Mm, I think it's because they're violent men who hate women. I don't, you know, it's not, it's not a difficult um, calculation, really. Men have done this for, for time. And I'm a big fan of men. I'm a heterosexual woman. I've got three sons. I've got a lovely husband. I'm a big fan of men. And I had no idea that the world was quite so misogynist. But as soon as women start saying no, there's some men that get very, very cross about it and will use any means necessary to shut us up. Are you ever afraid to put yourself in this position? Because you're always speaking in public, surrounded by these people in black masks. You know, they look intimidating from my perspective, and I'm just watching it on a screen. Um, I was too, I was very frightened in New York. I got, um, I had credible death threats in Portland, so we didn't do the tour in Portland. The, we had to cancel that date. In New York, where there were 60 New York police officers, they said they wouldn't um, at all protect me to go into the, the um, rally that I'd organized to speak. Today at Hyde Park, I was assaulted by somebody who decided just to uh, fill my face full of water. Um, it could have been anything in that bottle. So um, am I afraid? I'm still more afraid to, to keep quiet. I'm still more afraid about the societal harm and the harm to individual women uh, to shut up uh, rather than speak up. So, uh, you know, until this, until there are no more children being transitioned, until no more language of women uh, is being erased or no more rights, uh, then I continue to be more fearful of being silent. Kelly J. King, thank you very much for joining me today. And after the break on Free Speech Nation, JK Rowling is cleared of transphobia because she's never said anything transphobic. And Matt Hancock cracks a joke. And it's almost time for social sensation. So I'll see you then. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At six, it's Deems and Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. 
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So every week we dedicate this part of the show to the wild world of social media and the stories which have captured our attention. So this week there was a tweet uh, showing support for Harry Potter author JK Rowling. This went absolutely viral. This was columnist, journalist and Twitter user EJ Rosetta. She, was, uh, she spent three months reading and researching the author's books, essays and tweets. Couldn't find anything transphobic. So this is what she said. She said, right, I'm done. Three months ago, I was tasked with writing an article detailing 20 transphobic J.K. Rowling quotes we're done with. Who on earth commissioned that? Goodness me. After 12 <laughs> weeks of reading her books, tweets, full essay, and finding the content of these quotes, I found uh, not a single truly transphobic message. Now, this is... Look, this is the point, is that we all know, anyone who's done basic research knows that J.K. Rowling has never said anything transphobic, ever. Quite the opposite. But the fact that um, a, a publication would commission mm. something... What confirmation bias with the title 20 transphobic thing? They've already decided that it must, but the, isn't it incredible that someone actually thought, hold on a minute, they're not there, so I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to announce it at great personal risk. Absolutely. And what, what that shows with the whole J.K. Rowling thing is that if that you repeat something often enough, it becomes the truth. Yeah. And you, people now take it to be that J.K. Rowling is transphobic and they'll say, oh, she hates trans people. And you go, OK, so what, what's your evidence for that? And then they look at you and go, you're transphobic. Yeah. Because for even asking the question. Yes. For asking for evidence. I mean, Sajida, mm. it gets very infuriating when you're dealing with fantasists, I have to say. Most of the arguments I have about this kind of thing online are with people who are attacking imaginary spectres of their imagination. It's just pointless. I know, I know. And, and then unfollowing, because, you know, as you know, I've been shadowed. Was that shadow word? Shadow bound? Yeah. Shadow bound, yeah. Yes. No, they still unfollow me because mm. I happen to like a tweet that supports that she's not transphobic. Yes. And it's like, well, you know, by association, you must be... And this, 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 this is kind of constantly happening. You know, like, so oh, if you don't believe... The... But that's not the truth. We've got evidence now, and you still want to believe what you want to believe, then we can't help you. But isn't this good, though, that a journalist who probably had preconceptions against her yeah. was all set to write this yeah, article yeah, yeah. saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to quote all the horrible... And, they're ju and they just weren't there. But kudos to her, because I think a lot of journalists would just misrepresent, yeah, make yeah. things up. Lie. <laughs> Lie. Yeah. Because she's had a lot of abuse now, simply for saying, I couldn't find any evidence. But she's then people, people will still be out there saying, it's made up, she's in on the game, or, or she's, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all crap. Because they won't, don't want to believe the facts. They will not believe facts the facts. Facts matter, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, the truth, let's just restore the primacy of the truth. I think it's really, really important. Um, right, now, Matt Hancock. So, later tonight, apparently, I don't watch no. the show, but apparently we're going to be learning if Matt Hancock will be crowned 
king of the I'm a celebrity jungle. Mm. So um, the internet, of course, has been enjoying some of the former health secretary's surprisingly entertaining moments. A TikTok video featuring the serving MP and Hollyoaks star Owen Warner proved particularly popular. Let's have a look at this. There should be another word for that like, someone else's left and right. Yeah, your left. There should be another word for that like, someone else's left and right. Yeah, your left. Gen is he quite funny, Matt Hancock? I don't know. I do... No? The, the, the problem with Matt Hancock is his stint as health minister during the pandemic, which we can all agree wasn't particularly successful. So the fact that he's been turned into this kind of fun figure on have a, I'm a Celebrity, it makes me a little bit queasy. Do you watch I'm a Celebrity? No, see, I haven't at all until last night mm. and watched two episodes back to back because my friend was staying over. Yeah. She watched it, so I watched it. And it's really interesting because he is like a robot. Like, you know, um, uh, uh, I'll be back, what's it, I'll celebrate. Schwarzenegger. Yeah, 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 Schwarzenegger. And he just, as he's going through the, you know, the water's all dusting and he's just walking like a casual walk and he's got no emotions and it's really almost like he's learning from all these jungle mates. Well, how to be human. How to be human. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really strange. Oh, dear. Yeah. God love him. It's still not a programme I'm going to watch, I'll be yeah. honest. But anyway, uh, we're going to go to this final part of the show now, which is where we talk through your unfiltered dilemmas. You've been very kindly emailing in all of your very uh, serious problems. Our first dilemma is from Leanne in Falmouth. Uh, Leanne says, I got USA in my Works World Cup sweepstake. I can't bring myself to support them because I can't stand Trump and I can't stand Disney World. I'm not even that keen on football. Do you think it's bad if I just don't pay the fiver? <laughs> is it weird that you would associate the, the, the uh, USA team with Trump necessarily yeah. or Disneyland? There's more to America than that, isn't there? Absolutely, there's Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger? Yeah. Yeah. He's Austrian. Yeah, exactly, yeah. but an American citizen. Yeah. But yeah. I just, no, support America. Yeah. Everybody hates America now. Be transgressive, be punk. Say, go America, go USA. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think you should support your streams. But also, in the sweepstake, I would advise that if you can, try and swap your team with someone else. Because other people who want to win will get uh, America. I've yeah. got a sweepstake and I've got um, Portugal and uh, Uruguay. Are they good? I think so. I, yeah. see, I know nothing about football. All I know is I that know my, my, my audience is smaller tonight because Spain and Germany are playing. Are, yes. they, are they good? Are they meant to be good? Yes, they're both former world champions. Andrew. Interesting. OK. So, Andrew, you don't, you don't like fashion, you don't like football. What do you like, Backgammon, mate? that's it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Our second dilemma now is from Callum. Callum says, I work in IT support. I noticed a colleague had been emailing someone about me behind my back, so to get revenge, I added Pornhub to their internet history and now they're facing a disciplinary. <laughs> should I come clean? <laughs> Obviously you should. That's outrageous. I mean, they could, presumably they could lose their job. You're not meant to be looking at porn unless... Uh, not unless you're in the Houses of Parliament, I think it's yeah. allowed there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's but, positively encouraged. Yeah, thanks. but isn't that... Uh, that's not fair, is it? Because although the revenge might have been, you know, justified in a way... Yeah. It, it's gone too far, hasn't it? it? It has gone too far, unless it's something, for instance, uh, like gay porn, and then you say, well, actually, I'm part of a marginalised group and you're just suppressing... <laughs> well, that would be the way to do it, That yes. would be the way to do it. And yeah. actually, what you're doing is you're shaming me because of my orientation. She, I mean, they have to come clean, don't they? Uh, yeah, they have to come clean, but I just want to know how he knew that someone behind his back was emailing. <laughs> he must have been looking oh. over their back then to see what they were making. He must have been snooping. Know? Exactly, yeah, snooping. you're a snooper. You're a snooper. We have no problem. sympathy for you, evil snooper. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us with Free Speech Nation tonight. This was the week when a feminist was threatened for arrest for speaking her mind, a Cambridge dean claimed that Jesus was trans and an American fashion company thought bondage and teddy bears went hand in hand. Thank you, of course, to my lovely panel, Sajila Kershey and Francis Foster, and to all my guests this evening. And by the way, if you want to join us live in the studio, be part of our wonderful audience, forget about the football, just go to www.sroaudiences.com. That's right there on the screen as I speak. Stay tuned for Mark Dolan tonight. That is next. And do not forget that Headliners is on every night at 11 o'clock. That's where comedians go through tomorrow's top news stories. Thank you ever so much for watching Free Speech Nation. I will see you next week. Farewell. <laughs>
to elsewhere should be dry, although there could be some fog patches in Yorkshire. Wales will start the new working week on quite a showery note, with some of the showers heavy in places. Best of the sunnier spells will be across the east of the country. The Midlands will also see some good spells of sunshine, although there could be some mist and fog patches around. The fog could be slow to clear in places, especially in the east, towards Lincolnshire. The patchy fog could also be felt.